you know what some of the stuff that you shared in uh, part one was was great i mean you know some of the tips for the entrepreneurs and you know why is it important in business for little details are big details over here you know um uh, love the way what you said is uh, you know you you invest more in your ingredients to put a uh, put a great product out there and a lot of people if they cheapen up the product they just don't know that they might be paying more i love that true story well years ago we were touring a, a meat packing plant and uh, they wanted to process some beef for us and our philosophy when it comes to food processing is we want to minimize the number of times we want to minimize the number of times that a uh, product is handled from the field to the plate mm -hmm. so every time it, it gets stopped off at a, a processor um it, the, the quality deteriorates so you want to make sure that you minimize it as much as possible so we were we were touring this meat plant and uh we, we came across this this huge drum of what looked like inside um dog food dog food dog food okay and so i asked the um the guy who was giving us a tour i said hey what's what is this and he said oh we mix that in the ground beef of one of your competitors and I'm not going to mention the name, of course. You've probably eaten there, but I'm not going to mention the name. And uh, I said, uh, oh, okay. So what it was, it's a filler. And and, and what it does, it, it basically yields, gives the operator uh, more yield in their ground beef. So let's say, for example, you you ha you cook 100 pounds of ground beef. Uh -huh. And if we cook 100 pounds of ground beef and we buy 8119 ground beef, we may lose 10%, 10 uh -huh. pounds. But um, what, um, what this does, it... Um, it acts, it is a filler, but it absorbs all the cook off, all the grease. So if you cook a hundred pounds, you're going to yield a hundred pounds and, or 110 now, if you add 10 pounds of that ingredient to it. So yeah. the consumer is basically carrying out this product, um, in their stomachs. It's, it's really disgusting when you think about it, but that's, that's what this filler does. And there's a lot of companies that do this. And what is a filler? It's a cereal. It's something that's it's a it's a probably a soy product that just okay. absorbs grease. It soaks. It's like a sponge. Oh, okay. But uh, but you know we have a simple philosophy. If you want to push a Mercedes out the uh, the front door, you can't bring in Chevrolet parts in the back door. Yeah. And it's really that simple. You have to use quality ingredients to get a quality product. You you have to. So and and I mean you know some of the stuff you shared in part one is is also great. Um. What do you what do you think in business? people miss most of the time a lot. Like, what is it like? And it can be any business. It doesn't have to be a restaurant. I'm in a business that you, you think you have had an experience with. You're like, man, you know what? They missed this detail. What do you what do you think? There's something that people always miss. And you, you know, if you're out there, you're like, I wish they would have done that. It would have done, you know. Well I, well, I don't know if it's any particular thing they've done other than um, – lose uh lose the connection or be disconnected if you will from their consumer from their from their from their customer uh, mm -hmm. i think it's very important that you know who your customer is and focus on them and not worry about anything outside your own walls because you have no control over that you know our i, I don't like our management team to focus on empty seats if you have a body in the seat that's where your focus should be and just keep it there and that's how you're going to build your business over time but I think sometimes people look too far in the future and not really focus on the here and now and take taking care of what you have control over. And that's probably most important. What What do you think about businesses? Like they might open up a location and it can be anything. It can be a, a, a boutique, it can be a restaurant, it can be a cell phone store. And then all of a sudden they have success with that one store. And then they're like, oh my God, I just need to multiply this. I need to scale this. And all of a sudden... They open and they open up too many stores and they grow too fast. What is your perception of that? What do you? What is well, your opinion of that? I've always liked uh, to grow uh, within my ability, but not just uh, operation ability, but uh, uh, our financial ability. Uh, well, I think what what hurts a lot of small businesses is they basically uh, get in over their head. Uh, you know, I think every person needs to live way below their means and an operator in a business needs to also operate below their means. And that means keeping your overhead as low as possible. Uh, you know, you get into some of these rent um, districts that charge X number of dollars per foot per year. That means you have to operate. Um, you have to hit a grand slam or a home run or a triple. But I mean, I think you, if you operate where, look, if I hit a single, I'll make it. If, if I hit a double, great, triple, fantastic, home run, all right. But, uh, 
I, I just think that people just get way in over their heads a lot because all it does is it forces you to have to do more volume. And, and when you open up any new business, your customer base basically consists of zero. When we open a new restaurant in a new market, that restaurant has zero regular guests. Yeah. What we're trying to do is change their habits uh, from going out on Friday or Saturday night and visiting other restaurants and changing it to come to us. So we, we run very paranoid uh, when we open in a new market because, again, we have a zero customer base and we're trying to build it from that point on. Now, fortunately, if you have brand uh, recognition and you're established, um, you know, you have some momentum there and, and it helps. But you, you don't want to go too far out in your, your own market uh, where people – or people won't know who you are, and you have to build it all over you again. You have to build it yeah. all over. So, uh, you know, you said lower your overhead down, live in your means. I, I want to talk about that because that's something that's, like, really interesting to me. Like, sometimes people might get some kind of success, and they go fancy all of a sudden. Right. Y you understand what I'm saying, fancy? I mean, they have brand clothes, you know, designer clothes and brand new big big body cars outside in the driveway. And well, a lot of times what happens is they, they define success by that. Uh -huh. And that is, I mean, it's, you know, when, when most people see a person that is truly successful and they're, they're living within their means and they may be driving a nice vehicle or have a beautiful house, um, they're seeing the results of what they did as opposed to the opposite. And, and I think that, um, you know, I would focus on how the person got there, not what they got, mm -hmm. not, not what they've been able to uh, afford after the fact. So what was the philosophy getting them there? Uh, and again, it goes back to all kinds of stuff, but you know, some of the habits I've mentioned, um, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, one of them, for example, is sense of urgency. Uh, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, you stop what you're doing, you know, people over paper all the time, just, people are the most important thing on this earth and you want to take care of them because they're the ones that are going to give you the lifestyle that you want if you ever uh, choose to go into business. So make sure that you take care of people. Uh, and especially in this day and age, you know, with, with the, uh, the invention of the, the, the smartphone and, and all these social media uh, mediums, uh, people don't interact as much as they used to. I mean, when was the last time you actually talked to someone on the telephone? We used these text messaging. Mm -hmm. But uh, to engage, interact, uh, that's a skill set that most people just are losing. Yeah. And the ones that can can really um, develop it and fine tune it and become a master of it, they're going to be the ones that are leading businesses in, in this country. Exactly. So part one, we had some tips for entrepreneurs. Part two, I want to talk about some tips right here. And one of my one of the thing I want to talk about is, you know, businesses, you know, going back right here, businesses growing too fast beyond their means and then going fancy. I mean, the business owners going fancy. I mean, when I say that is like, they have had a little success or short term success and all of a sudden buying big houses, buying big cars, designer, designer clothes, fancy vacation yeah. avail. I mean, well, you know, and give some tips for the entrepreneurs. Well, too. I mean, if you have the cash to do it, that's one thing, but if you have to put it on a credit card or still finance it, uh, that's another, you know, I mean, I have zero personal debt, zero. And I'm going to keep it that way. Now I have business debt, but it's in relation to our volume and, and our balance sheet looks great. But I think uh, once you get to a point where you're having to support your lifestyle out of your business, you're going to have problems eventually. So I don't like, I mean, if I don't have the money, I don't buy it personally. What about some, some entrepreneurs They, you know, when, when I was in, you know, I've been in business for 21 years and, and a lot of people used to always tell me, well, write it off, write it off. And I always used to, I remember at one time I told somebody, I'm like, when I write it off, it's a loss to me. And they're like, no. And, and I'm like, look, I'm not going to argue about that. And even today, when I say, when I write off something, it's a loss. Okay. Uh, and I always kind of kept my overhead really low, you know. Your first door was Almeida, right? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I just kept my overhead really low. I still believe in keeping my overhead really low. I believe in business credit, but no per business debt, but no personal debt. I don't believe robbing my business to get cash out of the business and you know leaving the cash poor. You want to keep reinvesting. Exactly. So what do you think about, you know, when a lot of these new entrepreneurs, the young entrepreneurs, they just drain the cash out of their businesses? Well, um, that's just it. They're draining it. They're not reinvesting it. And uh, when you buy something that loses value overnight, then, you know, that's probably not the best route to go. But 
I mean, I just love buying things. I mean, I'm building a house, for example, right now, and I would have much rather have gone out and purchased a house because I could have seen the value and, and right there and, and w- worked a deal on it. But when you're building something, um, it's it's just a little different. You're going to lose a lot of your soft cost and, and other expenses that you incurred during the development of the property. So, you know, uh, it's a little different game, but mm-hmm. I'm still doing it with cash. I'm still doing my own money, so I'm comfortable in that aspect. But I could only imagine if someone financed it, um, a new house, it's, it's just to me a waste of money uh, if you're financing it uh, to a point where um, you didn't, I mean, you didn't have the money to build it in the first place. So it's going to hurt your business. But I think you just need to grow in proportion to the size of your company. And if you do that and do it uh, responsibly, you'll be okay. Let's talk about this borrow money for business, right? Um, Tillman Fertitta said in his new book that he's a big believer of borrowing money. Right. You borrow money. Right. What, what are your beliefs about that? Well, I mean, you, you, ha- you, you have to, to a degree. I mean, well, one example, since we buy our own dirt, dirt mostly and, and build our own, own our own buildings, um, I, I've always approached our, most of our projects with a, um, almost a 50% equity injection, which is really high. And it's almost impossible to grow at that, at that level. So we've actually increased that a little bit. But uh, that's because uh, we can forecast, you know, out X number of years and, and know that we'll get our return uh, eventually. But, you know, real estate's not going down. Um, it's it's going to continue to climb. And so, um, you know, my first project that I did, total project cost was $1.1 million. The second creek goes. Um, the third one was uh, about the same, one point two, And then, so everyone's increased just a little bit. Uh, um, our most recent one that we're doing is seven million, but we're we're in, we're uh, not injecting fifty percent. We're probably injecting only about twenty twenty five percent. Twenty twenty five percent. So so do you believe that you should borrow money for real estate or new locations? Well, I would borrow money for anything you can sell. You now, can sell. If, yeah. In other words, I don't like. To, I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong with leasing, but if you were to lease a property in the strip center to build out a restaurant, and he had to finance that restaurant, uh, the build out. Mm-hmm and it doesn't work you're still obligated for that loan and you don't own the asset to even sell it yeah so you're 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 stuck and so the, the best thing about owning your dirt in a restaurant for example is um in a worst case scenario the business goes under at least you have an asset you can sell yeah, you can sell absolutely i i truly believe that too um so you so you are definitely an, a believer of owning versus renting whenever you can yes okay but i will say and this is something very important too because um you know i've, I've changed a little bit on how i, I approach deals uh, more important than um than owning is location because uh especially with restaurants now you don't want to be an island to yourself out in the middle of nowhere that mm-hmm. you may own the dirt but no one's going out there Whereas you could be in, in a development with all the synergy of, of uh, all these other businesses drawing people to this development. So that's very important. We have a store, we own the dirt, but it's in a development that uh, it's been a hit since day one. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that, sometimes that can take time. So you said you say not in the island of its own. So do you, and, and I get it, that you want to be in a synergy of other shopping center and a food store, or grocery stores or whatever it is. What do you, what is your opinion about being next to other restaurants? Uh, it's fantastic, actually. Yeah, you know, we opened up our fourth Gringos next door to a Casa Ole, uh-huh. and they were concerned that we were opening up next to them, but their sales actually increased when we opened. And so, I truly, I'm a true believer of that. Yes, I mean, yes. You know, yeah. a lot of furniture stores because you know, that's I'm in furniture business, so a lot of people always a concern when we open up next to them or something like that. My thing is, if a credible a uh, competitor opens up next to you. You should be happy He's gonna bring people because too. because we're all going to bring in people and we're all going to have, and the customer is going to have more, uh, you know, op- uh, you know their options or the shoppers are going to have more options yes. and they're going to be more confident because, and, and more, it'll draw more shoppers and it'll and become a destination. Should, and they're probably there to spend money. I mean, exactly. You know, uh, what's interesting is there's a lot of um, cities like Mexico City and, 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 a lot of countries actually where they have districts. I mean, exactly. You know, that are just for electronics or just for furniture or bridal dresses or what have you. I think California does too. Yeah. Some of them LA. Yeah. Yeah. LA area fashion district. Yeah. And, uh, uh, like they will have just one area with 
everything. So they'll call it like a furniture roar, restaurant roar, right? You know, right. stuff like that. I, I, too bad Houston doesn't have the zoning. Yeah, Houston. it's good and bad, I guess. Yeah, you know, Houston's so spread out, so spread out. Now you said something about people. People are important, you know. So, and I always say people are the most important assets a business can have. Right. And I know you truly believe that. Right. And they're not on a balance sheet. Yeah. Well, and they're not on your balance sheet. Talk, talk about a little bit about that. Your opinion about why, why are you, why do you believe people are your true assets? Well, I, I don't. Our biggest assets. Well, for one, um, um, one thing that people don't realize is how important so many people are to your success, to your ultimate success. And the more people you can have that are supporting you, the more successful you're going to be. And because uh, you're not going to do it on your own. There's just absolutely zero way you're going to do it on your own. So I knew early on that if I wanted to reach the kind of life that I wanted to reach, that it was going to take a lot of people getting me there and supporting me once I got there. And, and in order to remain there, I have to also support them and, and keep them in the back of my mind uh, in, in everything we do and every, every decision we make. And, you know, we, we just recently, for example, at our gringo stores, we increased the server rates for all of our servers. A lot of po people don't realize that servers uh, earn two thirty an hour. And the last time that that's the federal minimum wage and the last time for tipped employees and the last time that was raised was in 1990 or 1991, which is a long time ago. <laughs> and it's insane. Now, uh, on the flip side of that, though, servers have their wages have increased because tips increased according to the check. According to the check, so the check went up. Yeah, so they they yeah. kind of went up. But it's still, what does it tell you that you, you're still only wanting to pay the next number of dollars? And you could have a server that's been with you 10 years making the same thing as the server just started yesterday, and what does that say? Yeah. It, it just doesn't make sense. So we actually increased our server rates as a way to retain uh, servers because there's a it's very expensive uh, interviewing, hiring, and training. And when you just have a revolving door, you're spending so much wasted dollars on that, and there's nothing like – having a veteran server come to your table that knows the menu inside and out and can really help guide the guest in a, in a, in a great experience. So you increase their wage based on their tenure? Tenure, tenure yes. It, okay. it keeps going up. We have some servers now making $10 an hour, several hours. Minimum, minimum, minimum wage. Yeah. So that does a lot for that server because if they work 40 hours, I mean, they went from $80 or $90 to 400 bucks. That's right. an extra $300 a week. Yes. Wow. That's, yeah. that's yeah. a house note. Yes. You know, good. They can, they can have good living. So good for you, but, you know, but 10 years, I mean, that's, that's a commitment. They give us a commitment. Years, they have you know? given you 10 years yes. of their life. Yes. You know, you just said, you know, it's hard. It's a revolving door training and hiring and everything else. And I want to talk to, I want to talk about this because this is great because you're in business. I'm in business. You know, you have had a lot more experience than, than me. Um, not a lot. Well, not a lot. at least a decade. <laughs> but 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 let's put it this way. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I always say that experience comes with with age and wisdom comes with age. I mean, I make a lot of mistakes every day. Well, you know, uh, I didn't. You know, when I first started, I didn't have all the answers. Yeah. Then neither did I, I. I don't have all the answers today, but I I try to surround myself and really listen to to input from everyone. Because everyone has something to, to say about, it, especially the ones that actually work it. You need to really pay attention to those people, the ones that are in the position, and 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 hear their challenges so you can solve solve the. Issue. You know why why I like why I like you, Russell. One of the things we have a lot in common because you some some things you you are trying to say, and I, you know, I'm like, man, I said this too, and you know, I'm trying to you know finish your words. And I my favorite saying that I always tell all my you know upper management or management uh, pe people in management. None of us is smarter than all of us. Well, and I like to tell people, if I'm the smartest guy in the room, there's a problem. There's a problem. Something is wrong. I'm not going to learn anything. Yeah. yeah. And, and none of us is smarter than all of us. And that's why I tell everybody, you know, teamwork is so important, you know, because we all learn from each other. Um, well, there's a proverb, twenty-seven seventeen, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens right. another. So, and you, that. You, yeah. So now let me ask you about this opening door, revolving yes. door. So yes. it's a revolving door yes. where the employees are coming and leaving and coming and leaving. And a lot of business people are having this challenge of retaining people and retaining talent and, you know, to keep it over there. And everybody blames the millennials, this, and, you know, the generations have, have a big gap and stuff. Tell me, what do you think about that? Well, I believe um, that most people, when they go work somewhere, uh, 
more than just a, a wage. They want to know that their their efforts are going to have meaning and purpose, because uh, you know life is very short, and to work for someone only for that one person or handful of people to prosper and benefit from their efforts, I think it sends the wrong message. And I think the by by uh, what's his name, the gentleman John Paul DeJoria with Patron Tequila, you know, he says um, success unshared is failure, and so. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I believe in conscious capitalism, mm-hmm. where it is about meaning and purpose beyond simply making money. And I think if you really uh, share in the success of a company, uh, whether it's through the employees or the community, and it just gives a whole different different meaning to going to work than just getting up to go make money just to, for the sake of making money for the shareholders, if you will. And uh, I think um, when you do that, it just elevates your business to a different level than your competitors, if, if unless they're doing the same, of course. And so that's that's how you compete in this day and age. Um, the attention span of most people is that of a gnat. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's just very short. I mean, uh, we're all guilty of it. You know, videos if they're too long, we 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 go to the next we, one. We go to the next one. Yeah. So what can we do to keep the employees? I mean, other than like you know, giving them some kind of purpose. Uh, that's that's what you have to do. Uh, quality of life. I mean, you know, every everybody has different needs. Uh-huh. Not not every. It's not a one size fits all. You really have to know the individual. There are some people that want to work sixty hours a week. There are some that only want to work thirty hours a week. Mm-hmm. And you just got to find where they fit in. It's about putting um, the right people on the bus. As uh, who was the author? Uh, Jim Collins mm-hmm. uh, from Great uh, Good to Great. Uh, putting the right people on the bus, but not only that, but having the right having them in the right seat. That's very, very important. I think sometimes we put people in the wrong role and then all you're doing is setting them up for, for failure and you don't want to do that. You, you, everyone has something to contribute and they want to, but just make sure they're in the right role. Make sure they're in the right role. 